Polycystic ovarian syndrome or PCOS is a term most of you must have heard already because it's very common nowadays. Most of the young girls and women are really scared to hear this term because they think it is a serious illness like some tumor in the ovary and that's going to ruin their fertility potential. As a matter of fact, polycystic ovarian syndrome is not that common. What is common is polycystic ovary. Now if we do ultrasound scan on every woman, perhaps in a class or you know in a college or in an office, we will find that 20%, like one out of five of these women, they have polycystic ovary. What is polycystic ovary? Poly means many and cystic means cyst-like. So it's not cyst. Cystic is an adjective. So cyst-like structures around the ovary. So any woman who has many small egg follicles, like the follicles which contains the egg around the ovary, about 8, 10 or 12, and their ovaries are little swollen, little enlarged in size, that is called polycystic ovary. Now these women are more likely to have irregular periods and also some male features like loss of uh, hair, unnecessary hair growth in face, in chest, acne, oily skin and these are the features of excess androgen or the male hormone. Now when women they have these features, in addition there are some hormonal imbalance like high LH hormone, then we call them polycystic ovarian syndrome. So of all those women who have polycystic ovary, maybe out of 15 or 20, only one will have polycystic ovarian syndrome. Now, if you want to uh, research on this subject, it has been found that those people who have polycystic ovary are often have some genetic predisposition. That means their mothers, their grandparents, the grandmother, or maybe aunt, they also have this problem. And many members of their family also suffer from diabetes. Now diabetes is a problem where perhaps you know there's deficiency of insulin hormone. In polycystic ovary, there's no deficiency, but there's an insulin resistance. That means normal insulin in their body cannot work. And because of that, these women have carbohydrate imbalance. So even if they eat very little, they have a tendency of putting on weight. So many of the women who suffer from polycystic ovary syndrome are also obese. So one brings other. It's like chicken and egg story. Polycystic ovary brings obesity and obesity brings more likelihood of developing polycystic ovary. So many of these women have irregular periods and when they plan to have a baby, they may need little help. Now, please remember what I said. I didn't say they suffer from infertility. They would require little more help than others. So there are lots of treatment now available. But before going to the treatment, the most important step for polycystic ovary is lifestyle modification. Now, what we mean by lifestyle modification? Now, in the current age, we are living a very fast life. We have very little time for exercise. We have loads of junk food. We have loads of addiction and we are working very long hours and that is taking a toll on our body. So women who have polycystic ovary, they need to do regular exercise at least one hour or maybe 45 minutes every day. And by exercise, I don't mean just walking. They mean brisk walking or running, jogging, swimming, cycling, joining a gym so that they can lose calorie. Now polycystic ovary syndrome settles on its own if women can lose 5 to 10 kilo of their body weight. We know it's difficult but it is possible. Many of our patients have lost more than 30 kilo weight just by doing exercise and change in their diet. Please note what I said. I didn't say dieting. I didn't say starving. I said change your diet. Avoid carbohydrate. Avoid rice. Avoid parathas. Avoid roll. And junk food. Now, you can have it once in a while, you can have it once a month or maybe twice a month. But the other days, you have lots of fruits and vegetables, 
You can have fish, you can have chicken, try to avoid red meat. You can have milk products, you can have lentils, you can have all sorts of nuts, but have in moderation. So what we need to do, we need to have several meals every day, not like a small breakfast, a huge lunch and a big dinner, not like that. We have a big breakfast around 7 o'clock, then maybe at 10, little snack, maybe at 1 o'clock, very light lunch, around 4 o'clock, again little snack, and your dinner should also be light at 7 o'clock. You should not eat a heavy meal at least 3 hours before going to bed. And if possible, have a walk. You know, we say walk a mile after the dinner. So at least walk for a little while. If that's possible, if you can't go out, walk on your treadmill. And have little, little drink like milk or something like that at bedtime. If you, maybe hot chocolate if you really feel hungry. So your major meal should be in the morning when you have sun. Because our metabolism is determined by the sunlight. So in the morning have a big breakfast because you have been fasting for last 8 hours when you are sleeping and then gradually your meal should be coming down. Have lots of salads, have yogurt, have lots of fluid. We should have at least 3 to 4 liters of water. So before every meal you should have 1 liter of water. So before breakfast, so when you have such large amount of water your stomach cannot have any food. So it's your, it's your thought process which determines. I usually keep a small plate. On my, in my clinic to show what should be the plate size of your food. It's not a big dinner plate but have a small amount of food repeatedly. If you feel very hungry have a fruit, have an apple, few nuts like that. So I spent such a long time in talking about diet for polycystic ovary syndrome and exercise because that is going to give you lifelong treatment. Otherwise there are many medicines which we can prescribe of course, we have had several success stories with the help of medical treatment, with the help of surgical treatment, but let's not talk about that. Let's change our lifestyle and we can actually take care of polycystic ovarian syndrome. And I repeat once again, polycystic ovary is not an illness. Polycystic ovarian syndrome is an illness. We can treat that syndrome, but we cannot remove polycystic ovary forever. Now many, many parents come to us and they ask, doctor do something so that this problem is cured for life. And I say, look, this is like some people are born with curly hair and some have straight. Now having a curly hair is not an illness. Some people have the eye color green or yellow, but majority of us have brown or black. Now, so some women are born with polycystic ovary and that is a condition they are born with. It is like your skin complexion, it is like your hair pattern that we cannot change. But these women are more prone to all this problem. That's what we can control. By controlling the lifestyle, we can treat the illness, but we cannot remove the polycystic ovary. There is no point doing repeated ultrasound scan to find out whether your ovary still have those small cysts or not. The good news about polycystic ovary is these women are actually positive in many sides. They are usually very successful in life. Do you know why? Because they have little bit more androgen in their system. You know we say some girls are tomboyish. That means you know they can fight, they can debate, they can bring any uh, you know bring sort of uh, positive arguments and these people are more successful academically and they are more successful professionally. Because so polycystic ovary is not a bad news. It is actually a success story. So those women who have polycystic ovary, not necessarily they should get depressed, but they have a different lifestyle in comparison to those without polycystic ovary. So I would like to leave with this message is having polycystic ovary is not a worry. You cannot change it, but you can avoid bringing the problem of polycystic ovarian syndrome which actually is not a good news because not only you have gynecological problem but eventually in late life you can have diabetes, you can have hypertension and there are also more likelihood of having uterine cancer because of the hormonal imbalance. But all these problems I have said are preventable so it is up to you, you decide whether you want to avoid this and believe me you don't have to go to a doctor, you can cure it yourself by reducing your body weight and by changing a healthy 
lifestyle and a healthy diet. I am sure you can do it because it is not difficult. Many of our patients have done it and I am sure many many other women will follow them. Endometriosis is a term which is not that common. It's not commonly heard by general people. And those people who have come with this problem to the doctor's clinic, they often find it's a sort of difficult term even to pronounce endometriosis. So it's quite sort of unknown thing and a difficult. So as soon as we say this term, people think it must be a very difficult disease. Now what is endometriosis? When I was working about um, nearly 35 years back towards my MD thesis in Calcutta University, my supervisor said, look, this is a topic which is so rare in India, you wouldn't get that many patients to complete your thesis within two years time. But lo and behold, even that time when we did proper research by investigation, we found that problem is not that uncommon, rather it is very common in the eastern part of India. Endometriosis is a problem where the lining of the uterus, which is called endometrium, comes outside uterus. That means so you find this tissue on ovaries, inside the tummy, sometime on the navel, we have found it in nose and even in chest. Now what happens? Normally when women menstruate, that means when they have bleeding, they have periods, the endometrium is actually shedded from the uterus. At the same time, under the influence of hormone, there is bleeding from those areas where endometrium is present. That means inside the tummy, within the pelvis, from navel, from nose and even inside the lungs. So these patients have a sort of blood in their sputum. Now interestingly, it happens only during the time of menstruation. So the patients come with the symptoms that I have nose bleeding at the time of menstruation. I am bleeding from my navel at the time of menstruation. Now it is not very common, but what is common is bleeding inside the pelvis or lower part of tummy. Women they have uterus, two fallopian tubes and two ovaries. The endometrium comes out through the fallopian tube and they settle on the ovary or they settle behind the uterus on the top of the vagina. Now there is no area this blood can come out from. So what happens that there is accumulation of blood and this lump causes pain and this pain comes just before the period and it settles when the menstruation starts. So when the patients come to our clinic and give this symptom that I do get pain just before the periods but as soon as the period starts my pain settles or this type of symptoms like I have got very bad pain which radiates down the leg goes down the leg up to my knees only during the time of menstruation then we know this woman may have endometriosis. I had a very interesting patient a lady who came she was about 40 years old she came to me saying that doctor I get knee pain every month during the time of period. Now I have seen so many gynecologists, they say no, no, we don't treat knee pain, you go and see an orthopedician and even the orthopedicians are not finding any problem. Now because I have a keen interest in endometriosis, I researched in endometriosis and I have worked in different institutes uh, in UK where they specialize in endometriosis, I immediately diagnosed and she got cured by the treatment of endometriosis. So what we have to keep in mind the symptoms may not be gynecological, symptoms may be nasal bleeding, symptoms may be bleeding on sputum, symptoms may be knee pain, but if they are related with menstrual cycle, then it has to be endometriosis. Endometriosis can be treated very easily with the help of medicine, like we need to stop the period. Very interestingly, the endometriosis settles during pregnancy, during breastfeeding, because there is no period. So what we need to do, we need to create a situation where it is like menstruation, it is like pregnancy. So what we call pseudo pregnancy state or when the ladies they stop their period at the menopause, endometriosis settles. So we can give medicine 
to create a situation like pregnancy. So that woman is not going to have period maybe for three months or six months and then the endometriosis problem settles. Or we can give medicine to stop the period altogether maybe for one year. Now for young women this treatment is not very effective because many of them would like to have pregnancies. By stopping period we cannot bring pregnancy. So those women who are complaining of pain only we treat with medicine. Those patients who are complaining of pain and also they wish to have uh, a child we do laparoscopy. So that's a form of surgery where we put the patient under anesthesia and look inside the tummy with the help of a telescope and we identify where there is endometriosis and we use different energies like laser energy, like diathermy energy which will evaporate the endometriosis and after clearing this up the pain settles dramatically and they do conceive very easily but the problem is many a time the endometriosis returns because as soon as they start menstruating again the menstrual blood will go and accumulate there so after surgery once they complete their family we usually tend to put these patients on some form of treatment so they do not have monthly bleeding they have bleeding every three months that means four bleeding every year and many patients are very happy with that they do not want this monthly botheration of periods and they are very happy even if we put some device like Mirena it's a medicine inside the uterus which stops their period altogether although they are not menopausal so they, these ladies do not have periods but they do not have any feature of menopause they have normal reproductive function and normal life so most of the time we can preserve all reproductive organs in endometriosis but rarely we get patients in a very advanced stage where all the structures are sort of muddled up together. They are all attached with each other and there are big cysts in the ovaries and there is terrible pain. In those cases, if the family is completed, we actually remove the uterus and both ovaries which is called hysterectomy and that can be done by open surgery or that can also be done by laparoscopic surgery. So the message to all of you is if you have symptoms like this, pain in the week before your periods, or some form of discomfort or bleeding which comes cyclically it may be outside the pelvic organ as I said nasal bleeding, nose bleeding, breathing difficulties just at the time please see a gynecologist and it may be endometriosis it's not cancer it can be treated very easily it can be treated with medicine if you do not treat endometriosis early sometimes it can result in infertility and very rarely if we neglect the problem that it can create very advanced endometriosis and such a difficult problem that you may need to have a hysterectomy and you lose your reproductive function and you go through menopause early. Of course there are treatment to treat all this but my message would be please be cautious so that you can identify the problem. It is not uncommon in Eastern India what we see the rice eating part of India like Kerala, like Assam, like Bengal have more endometriosis in comparison to Delhi or Mumbai where the rice is the not main, you know, the main meal. It is chapati and we don't know, as yet we don't know why. It may be related with diet. It, there may be a genetic predisposition. Maybe people of these part of India, they have more endometriosis. So you can detect endometriosis early by coming to your doctor if you have cyclical symptoms and I think that is the best way forward to identify it early so that we can treat and cure it early. Endometriosis can be cured and we can prevent the recurrence of endometriosis by taking some medicine regularly. Miscarriage is a term which brings lots of sadness to any family. Miscarriage is loss of life at a very early stage, in the early stage of pregnancy. Now it is true, we reassure these women by saying that you haven't really lost an organ, so you can conceive again and maybe in the next pregnancy you're not going to lose the baby. But there are rare situations where these women have 
many miscarriages, like one after another miscarriage, what we call recurrent miscarriage or recurrent pregnancy loss. So, in the early part of pregnancy, without any reason whatsoever, suddenly they have bleeding, they have pain, and they lose the pregnancy. Sometimes there is no symptom at all. When they come for ultrasonography, it's shown that the pregnancy has stopped growing, what we call missed miscarriage. Now, in majority of the cases, miscarriage, we find some cause or other, but in small minority, we do not find any cause. The causes are fivefold. First, it could be some chromosomal problem, some genetic problem from the husband or wife. So the sperm has some defect or egg has some defect. Or maybe the sperms and eggs are healthy, but when they are joining together, there is some chromosomal abnormality, some genetic abnormality. So nature doesn't want abnormal babies to be born. So these pregnancies are stopped by nature in the form of miscarriage. The second cause is infection. There are many infections which can cause repeated pregnancy loss. The third is hormonal imbalance, thyroid problem, prolactin problem, excess LH like in PCOS can cause miscarriage. The fourth is clotting problem. Many a time we find there are small blood clots formed between the circulation of mother and baby. And this is called anti-phospholipid antibody syndrome. And finally, there may be some structural problem inside the uterus. Uterus is, has got a like partition. There is some tumor inside the uterus like a fibroid, a polyp, or there may be some adhesion so the uterus cannot grow. Maybe uh, the cervix, the neck of the uterus is loose. So as the pregnancy grows, suddenly the mouth opens, the neck opens and the lady loses the pregnancy. Now we have different tests where we can identify the cause of this problem and they can be treated. Now it has been said that even in those cases where we cannot find any cause, if we give supportive therapy to this patient, lot of sympathy, lot of compassion, then the success is inevitable. So it is said the best treatment of recurrent pregnancy loss is tender loving care or TLC. So if any of you have gone through the sad experience of recurrent pregnancy loss, please visit a specialist, obstetrician and gynecologist who would do some investigation to find out the cause and it can be treated. We have treated women who had seven miscarriages in the past and she conceived and delivered successfully healthy baby on the eighth attempt. So there is nothing to be worried about. There is nothing that we cannot solve. It is up to you to come to a specialist, investigate yourself rather than be very sad and depressed and keep it within yourself. Don't get demoralized. Recurrent pregnancy loss is a problem which can be treated.